When I was asked if I would speak at your church service this Sunday, I counted it an honour because I know that this is a special memorial weekend mourning the loss of military personnel who have died serving in the armed forces. And I gather that Memorial Day on Monday is also considered the unofficial beginning of summer for you. Get the barbecues out. I appreciate you inviting an Englishman to speak as you acknowledge in church services those who have been and are involved in the protection of the country. Britain actually has something a little similar and we have it in November. It's called Remembrance Day. And the day is observed on the 11th of November to recall the end of the First World War and conflict since that time. Hostilities formally ended at the 11th hour, at the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. Included in the Remembrance events is a special gathering in London's Royal Albert Hall. The most poignant time for me is when a million paper poppies fall to mark those who have died. It's a very quiet during the falling of those poppies representing the many who have died. You know, the Bible honours soldiers. It does not honour war, but it honours those who were willing to fight war so that good may happen. When a soldier appears on the pages of the New Testament, he appears with commendation. There are five Roman centurions whose lives are told in the New Testament, and if you read their stories, they're all positive right to acknowledge the blessing we have because of the sacrifice of others. But we need to mark occasions like this with realism. The British author H.G. Wells coined the expression the war that will end war to describe World War I which broke out in Europe in September 1914. Wells believed the conflict would create a new world order that would make future conflicts impossible. We are not so optimistic today, are we? So, to mark this special service and not use a church service as an escape from the real world outside, but to prepare us to go into what is happening and will happen, I want us to ask and seek to get the answer to this question. What of the future? And we're turning to the Bible for the answer. Now, I know that to many people that's very strange. Surely we should turn to the news media. No. You see, the Bible has a 100% record of success when making predictions. There was a book published as the year 2000 began, Predictions for the Next Millennium. Celebrities, scientists, entertainers were asked to make predictions of what would happen. Well, we're well into the next millennium, and it's laughable. Most said there's going to be world peace and a cure to every disease. One said there's going to be car racing on Mars. So far, their batting average is zero in looking at the predictions of what's going to happen. The Bible makes predictions about what's going to happen on a number of different fronts. I can only skim over the surface. But you know what? God graciously tells us just enough without telling us too much because, frankly, there's some things about our future we don't really want to know. The name of my message today is Surviving the Coming War. Jesus said the end is coming. 
like a building being torn down, the physical structure of the universe will disintegrate. Our world will go up in fire. Now we know that from the Bible, but we also know that from the scientific community regularly reminding us that we live in a limited universe. Science didn't always teach this. Up until the 1950s and early 1960s, they said that the universe is eternal. It's going to go on and on. It was called the steady state theory. Today we know better. Well, I want us to zero in on the prediction made about the future, particularly in Ezekiel 38. Now, it doesn't tell us everything we want to know. In fact, one quarter of our Bible makes predictions about the future. So this is only one part of the jigsaw puzzle, and we go to the rest of the Bible to get a much more completed picture as God wants us to know it right now. So we will need to put the prediction of Ezekiel into the context of that bigger picture. And keep in mind, nothing in all history so far matches what Ezekiel describes. And also, New Testament writers pick up on what Ezekiel predicts and say it will happen. So we're asking what will happen in the future. Will there be another world war? If so, how can we be sure to survive it? Let's think first about the coming again of Christ. Secondly, the coalition attack on Israel. And thirdly, the consequences for us. Let's start with this wider picture, the coming again of Christ. It dominates the Bible. Do you know this? 1,845 times the second coming is alluded to or predicted. For every one mention of the first coming of Jesus, the second coming is mentioned eight times. The first coming is important, right? Jesus coming to earth, dying on a cross. The return is eight times more. So, we know there will be an end of the world and Jesus will be back. Currently, God is doing work around the world in getting people as Christ's followers. But this will end suddenly. The Bible says it's coming like a thief in the night. Thieves don't text to tell you what time they're arriving. I'll be with you at three in the morning. I have a couple of other houses to rob, so I might be a little late. It will help if you will pile up stuff ready for me, as that will save time. No, they show up unexpectedly. And this age of God drawing people to himself will abruptly come to an end. We call it the rapture of the church. That word rapture is from the Latin rapto. A seizing up, a taken away, and it's used for a very good reason, because it's in the Bible. It's going to happen. There will be that lifting up of those who are true followers to be with him in the air. And by the way, this is not a recent belief, as some would have us think. God has big plans. There's an end that the Bible predicts. To the world. Now we don't know when and we are not asked to become naive. Any of you remember the book that was published in 1988 titled 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988? You know it's one thing to write a book and be wrong. It's another thing to write a book and be wrong 88 times. And boy was it wrong. But Jesus is coming, and we must be ready. But the exact time, wisely, that is held back from us. So, what will happen? 
Ezekiel 38 tells us that it will include a coalition attack on Israel. Now, some people believe it will happen before believers are taken to be with Christ, but the most natural place to put this is after the rapture. Jesus could come at any moment and we should be ready for it. There will then be tribulation. There were tough times in the past, but this will be the toughest time. If you Google worst times in history, please don't do that now, it gives a list including the Holocaust, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. All of those times are nothing compared to the tribulation that is coming. And by the way, never are we told in the Bible to look forward to the tribulation period. The Bible didn't say, watch and wait for it, be eagerly waiting for the worst times in the world. We are, however, told to anticipate and look forward to Christ's coming. So the next event on God's timetable is the rapture of true followers of Christ. There's nothing that has to be fulfilled before that happens. So the good news is Jesus is coming back. The bad news is Jesus is coming back. You see, it's both exciting and excruciating because it depends on where we are at in our life with God. Which brings us to Ezekiel 38. The coming again of Christ will be followed by the coalition attack on Israel. Ezekiel describes an invasion led by a leader and it's the area known today as Russia. This leader forms a military alliance and attacks Israel at some point. Then Ezekiel predicts something truly incredible. That enemy coalition is defeated. Reading the text, it's not Israel and their allies winning against the enemy. It's God alone who moves supernaturally to defend Israel and destroy her enemy. And if you think this is crazy talk, the Jewish people know about this. Talk to rabbis and they will speak of a coming war, the war of Gog and Magog. They think it will come before the Messiah comes. And not only the Jews, Muslims know about this. In the Quran, there is the battle of Shazus and Majus. Ezekiel 38 has some strange names and it's not irrelevant. It has everything to do with us and who knows, maybe the near future. We don't know everything, but it was Jesus talking about these times who said we can know some things, know and understand. That's what he said. Listen to this word of the Lord. Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Prophesy against him and say, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws and bring you out with your whole army, your horses, your horsemen, fully armed and a great horde with large and small shields, all of them brandishing their swords. Persia, Cush and Put will be with them, all with shields and helmets. Also Goma, with all its troops and Beth Togoma from the far north, with all its troops, the many nations with you. Now let's get the big picture here. 
Bear in mind, Ezekiel has to use phraseology familiar to him. Jesus Christ will come in the air and call his people to be with him in heaven. There will then be seven years of tribulation, trouble the like of which the world has never seen before. Daniel predicts Israel will make an agreement with other nations to protect them. After three and a half years, this leader will break the agreement and try forcing a complete allegiance to him. There will be another three and a half years of that seven years when the world will experience even more trouble. God is giving time to people to turn to him and many will. This time will climax with Christ's return to the earth to defeat his enemies and establish his kingdom. Finally, God, having tried so much to bring people to himself, will say, I'm too good to let evil go on forever. I am too just to allow injustice to prevail. Enough is enough. And God will separate people permanently into those who want him and those who don't. And there will be a new earth and a new heaven. Now that's the overview, the big picture. So, during the first half of the tribulation period, Israel is in her land, protected by strong political leadership. It's a time of peace and safety because other nations won't threaten them. It's in the middle of this seven-year period the problems really begin. The leader of this invading army is named Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Now that locates them between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. The title Chief Prince can be translated Prince of Rosh. That has the suggestion of Russia in it. And therefore Meshech is Moscow and Tubal is Tobolsk. Both Russian cities this man rules over Meshach and Tubal. His allies are Persia, today's Iran, Kush, today's Ethiopia, and Put, today that's Libya. By the way, Russia and Iran are forging an alliance never seen before in history. Hundreds of Russian scientists work in Iran right now helping to build its nuclear capability. Other people groups are mentioned, Goma and Beth Togoma, both located near the Black Sea. Now that's the bad news. Here's the good news. I can tell you the end of the story even before it's begun. God will defeat this vast coalition army and rescue Israel. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, I am against you, O Gog, I will turn you around. Now the question we may be asking is, why would this coalition attack Israel at all? And verses 12 and 13 state that the overt purpose is to seize the wealth they come to plunder and loot. Go to Israel today and it's not what it was since 1948 and their nation state. A desolate wilderness has been completely turned around. It's a productive and prosperous country, hardly the size of Wales. But I think there is a deeper reason behind this attack. Many of these nations named identify with Islam. And there is a deep hatred of the Jews. 
The Dome of the Rock is a revered Muslim monument in Jerusalem that has stood on the ancient temple site area for centuries. They may think that this is the way to protect it. Whatever the thinking might be, clearly it's the Lord who brings this army out. Verse 16, you will advance against my people Israel like a cloud that covers the land in days to come, O Gog, I will bring you against my land, so that the nations may know me when I show myself holy through you before their eyes. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Are you not the one I spoke of in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel? At that time, they prophesied for years that I would bring you against them. So how should we live in light of this? That's the big issue, isn't it? That makes it more personal to us. Think about the consequences for us. There's more than I have time to say. There isn't anything we can do to stop war. But here's what we can do. We can become the person God created us to be so that no matter what happens, we're ready for it. Wouldn't we expect Jesus to say, you will hear of wars and rumours of wars, so be prepared for trouble, or you will hear of wars and rumours of wars, so keep an anxious eye on the times Expect to feel uneasy and prepare for the many troubles to come. But that is not what Jesus said. Listen to him. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that you are not troubled. Don't panic. Even when we are surrounded by wars and rumours of wars. Now, how is that possible? How can you live in a world like we live in today and not be troubled? I mean, watch the daily news. Isn't it depressing? You may have started out happy and you end up very unhappy by the time you've absorbed what it has to say. You feel anxious. The way to handle the stress is all wrapped up in the peace that we find in God's promise, presence and plan. I feel grieved by the conflicts that harm and destroy so many people, especially so many innocent people. We ask good questions about why these things happen, but here's what I want to tell you. This is God's promise. One day it's all going to end. Jesus is going to stop war and it will never happen again. If you're a Christian, that should bring hope to your heart. We're not going to have to live with war for eternity. And this is not pie in the sky by and by. This could happen, get this, within seven years. Just think about this. If Jesus were to come tomorrow, we'd go to be with him and the tribulation will take place for seven years. At the end of that seven years, he comes back and sets up his kingdom. So we could be seven years away from this big intervention by Jesus to start to put things right for eternity. Now, if that doesn't energise you, I don't know what will. And there's more. We can get peace not only from the promise of God about the future, but from the presence of God in the present. There's not anything we ever face as followers of Jesus Christ that we have to face alone. He himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. 
Every morning as I start the day, I'm reminded I'm getting ready to face this day, but not by myself. God is with me. And when we don't know what's going to happen and when the sky's dark, just remember God's promise. I will be with you. And God's plans will not be stopped. Who are we trusting in? When things are swirling around so uncomfortably, concentrate on Jesus. Let our mind be filled with who he is and his power and strength. Peace is found in trusting the person who controls all the things we don't understand and who knows the mystery behind everything. How do we experience this remarkable peace? By keeping our mind focused on the Lord. Do you ever take time during the day to stop and think about who Jesus really is and what he has done? We say, I'm worried about the future. Well, the Lord has already taken care of our eternal future if we put our trust in him. And if he is capable of dealing with our eternal future, don't we think that he can get us from here to there? <laughs> so trust in the Lord with our whole heart. Trust him with the struggles and sorrows of life. I believe with all my heart that what God is saying to us during these days is not that there won't be devastation and sorrow. God is delaying his intervention to allow more people to turn to him. He wants a big family. And God is saying, through Christ we are strengthened. We can be everything we need to be, no matter what is happening. Bruce Belfridge was a radio newsreader as bombs fell on London in the Second World War. A bomb hit the BBC's radio studios during the nine o'clock news and people were killed. Bruce Belfridge was reading the news as the building crumbled around him. But he calmly kept reading as if nothing had happened. And all the listeners at home heard was a dull thud and someone whispering, Are you all right? Belfridge's only comment was, carry on, it's all all right. That's what Jesus tells us to do. Jesus is going to return. It could be before we meet the next time. But what are we to do? Just carry on. Be the person God called us to be, a follower of Jesus. Tell people that we are a Jesus follower. As bad as war is, it's nothing compared to the strength God puts in us when we put our trust in him. And that's what we need to do. But I want to add, if you're not yet a believer and you're trying to help yourself and trying to satisfy yourself, give up. I ask. In all of your searching for pleasure and satisfaction, are you truly satisfied? The only thing that can help us is the saving grace of Jesus. An inscription on a tombstone in England says, Pause, stranger, when you pass me by, as you are now, so once was I, as I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. A passerby read this and was heard saying, To follow you is not my intent until I know which way you went. If you don't yet know Jesus, now is the time. The only one who can fix the earth is the one who created the earth and he will fix it. And he can fix your life and he can do it starting right now. If you have not surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you can do that 
So he sets up his kingdom inside you by his spirit and is ruling over your life. His will be done in your life and my life and ready for the future. One of my favourite sayings by C.S. Lewis is this. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. We are going to another world and before we enjoy the new heaven and the new earth, we're going to come back to this earth for 1,000 years, ruling and reigning with our Saviour. I haven't given you the details of this, maybe another time. Meanwhile, live in a state of readiness. Look forward to Christ's return for us. One thing for sure, we're not going to be bored. You've seen these cartoon characters sitting on clouds playing a harp sprouting wings. Could you think of anything more boring than that? God is not boring. So the future with God definitely isn't going to be boring. It's going to be exciting. I pray for anyone who is here who has not surrendered to Christ yet, I pray that you will. Before we leave, right where you are, you could open up your will to God's will. You could open up your life and let him in. I pray that you would just say this to him if you haven't done it yet. Lord, I give you my life. I surrender my life to you. I admit I'm a sinner, please forgive me. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died on a cross. I believe he shed his blood for my sin. I believe he rose from the dead and I turn from my sin. I repent of it. I turn to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to live for you. In Jesus' name, Amen.